This is our eighth annual Theodore Roosevelt Symposium, and each one has had a different character, each one has had a different theme, each one has a different sort of personality, and I'm just loving this one. I think this one is so fresh and new, things that we have never talked about before. Um, you know, one of the, oh, thank you, thank you. One of the presidents of this institution said we should do proceedings. We should gather up the transcripts of what people say and publish them, and we don't do that, but we have the proceedings on video. But some of the papers that have been delivered here, and they're really not papers, they're talks, but some of the talks have been groundbreaking Roosevelt scholarship and have sort of been the foundation of, of Roosevelt scholarship that needs to come. And so we're just thrilled with the, the uniformly high quality of, of all the presentations and you're hanging in there. I want to thank the mayor, Dennis Johnson, our friend, for being here today, and he was here last night, but Dennis has been a wonderful supporter of what we do, and, uh, and we really appreciate that, given what's going on in Western North Dakota and Dickinson, uh, for Dennis to take this time and to come up and spend an evening and a full day is, is like 10 days five years ago, and so we're so appreciative of that. Tomorrow, we're going to Medora. The weather is absolutely perfect. It'll be a little chillier than today, so if you're from out of town, uh, bring a coat. And when the, if you've never heard of the wind chill, it actually matters. Uh, uh, it, it can be 20 degrees below zero in North Dakota, and if it's calm, that's not so bad. But if there's a one mile an hour wind, it'll take your skin right off. And so, bring bring appropriate clothing. It'll probably be 10 degrees cooler tomorrow. And there are going to be two hikes. There was one hike is a, a relatively mild stroll, really, to the old entrance station, which is very interesting. And so that'll be for those who wish it. But several people have said, that doesn't seem very Rooseveltian. Let's do something heroic. And so if you're interested in doing a more strenuous hike, um, raise your hand. OK, so I'll tell Valerie that we do need the, um, the second van for those, uh, it's a second person. And uh, this is, look, this is a great hike. It's, it's 112 miles. Uh, <laughs> most of it's over level terrain. TR would love it. Uh, we'll stop in Weibo and punch out a drunk. Uh, so that, so those, those of you who want the more strenuous hike, if you see Valerie, and Valerie's back there, just uh, talk to her and so she can make sure that we've got this all covered. At the end of the uh, session now, there will be a social um, um, a reception for, for the, our paid guests at the Alumni Center here, and the dinner begins down at the same student center at 5.30, and of course, don't miss tonight at 7 p.m. for uh, this extraordinary performance by our friend Hal Cannon and a secret guest, so come back for that and bring others if you can. To continue with our final lecture of the day, which is by our friend Dr. Beverly Everett, who's played a role in several of our projects, and you'll see what an interesting and unique role she's played in the development of our, uh, our, our center, our website. I'd like to ask another of our uh, TR honor students, Lexi Adolph, to come up and introduce. Well, good afternoon, and as Clay said, my name is Lexi Adolph, and I'm here as a Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Scholar and Executive Committee Member, but as we TRs like to call it, I'm part of TREK. I'm a chemistry major here at DSU in my second year, and I minor in biology and leadership. As Clay said, our next section of the symposium is on Roosevelt's White House and the arts, and who better to discuss the arts than one of North Dakota's current residents, Beverly Everett. Dr. Everett is a music director for both Bismarck Mandan and Bemidji Symphony Orchestras. Both groups have seen incredible growth under her direction and leadership, and her experiences have awarded her many achievements. For instance, she's the youngest ever recipient of the Friend of the Arts from Bemidji in 2009, as well as the Bismarck Mandan's business, Watch Magazine's 40 Under 40, for making a difference through her work in the North Dakota region. She got her undergraduate degree from Baylor where she majored in organ and conducting and she continued her education further to earn a doctorate of musical arts at the University of Iowa. Dr. Everett is also an avid runner who has participated in the leading ladies half marathon in Spearfish, South Dakota earlier this year 
and she says something that most inspires her in her running is one of Theodore Roosevelt's famous quotes from The Man in the Arena. On behalf of the TR program, we are pleased and excited to welcome Dr. Beverly Everett. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to especially thank Sharon and Clay for having me today. As I, as I told the students this morning, mostly in my work, I, I work through nonverbal communication. So for me to get to speak to you this afternoon is quite an honor and on one of my favorite subjects. Um, just to set the scene a little bit about music in the Roosevelt White House, in 1885, New York philanthropist Jeanette Thurber founded the National Conservatory for American Music in New York. The goal was to create a conservatory modeled after the National Conservatory in Paris and to create a national music spirit in America. And in 1892, she engaged famed Czech composer Antonin Dvorak to be the director of that conservatory. His main goal was to discover an American music and to engage it in a similar way that he had used his own Czech folk tunes in his music. Shortly after his arrival in America, he wrote a series of newspaper articles reflecting on what he felt was the state of music in our country. And he supported the concept that African American and Native American music should be used as the foundation for growth of all American music. He felt that through the use of these idioms that Americans would find their own national style of music. Some of you may be familiar with his New World Symphony which is based in part um, inspired by the Hiawatha poem and uses both the Negro spiritual as well as Native American folk tunes. While there's no specific evidence that Theodore Roosevelt's path crossed with Dvorak's, the common threads of a call to find a true American voice in music and literature are clear. Later in 1916, Theodore Roosevelt agreed to write a series of 12 articles for the Ladies' Home Journal. And in one of the articles, he expanded his definition of a strenuous life to include things like writing a book or a poem or studying Indian songs. In his essay, Nationalism in Literature and Art, Roosevelt felt that when a culture was ready for blossoming, that it needed great leadership to do so. And he felt that our country was poised at that time to do this because of its ethnic and racial composition that had gelled into an original American type. And he hoped for a cultural revival. Scholar Kathleen Dalton credits Roosevelt with being the first president to make it actually patriotic to defend American artistry and literary creativity. Roosevelt had a concern that Americans lacked a kind of world view that would deepen their understanding of culture and art. When he and Edith issued White House invitations and created these salons, which I'll demonstrate in a few minutes, of writers, artists, musicians, reformers, and intellectuals, they wanted to show America and the rest of the world that there was greatness in our culture, specific greatness that deserved that recognition. Specifically, they promoted genuine Americana through the Negro spiritual, cowboy songs, as we heard about this morning, and Native American Indian music and culture. Roosevelt was noted at one point for saying to an industrial school, and it was somewhat condescending, but I think it also speaks to his support of the use of the Negro spiritual and the promotion of that music. He's quoted as saying, I feel there's a very strong chance that gradually out of the capacity for melody that your race has, we shall develop some school of American music. Two people to whom President Roosevelt listened about the value of Indian music were composer Arthur Nevin and scholar Walter McClintock. Unlike the vast majority of the performers who were invited to the White House when Roosevelt was president, most of those performers were chosen and invited by Edith Roosevelt. But Arthur Nevin and Walter, McClint Walter McClintock had the distinction of being invited by Roosevelt himself. Um, 
at Nevin's first visit to the White House prior to his performance, he said that Roosevelt, with his extensive knowledge of Native American lore and customs, carried on a conversation with me in the sign language of the Blackfeet Indians, and shortly thereafter, a proposal to talk about his opera Poya followed. On April 23, 1907, Arthur Nevin presented an illustrated lecture of his opera Poya in the East Room of the White House for one of the music halls. Poya tells the legends of the Blackfeet Indians in Montana about the sun god and their rituals. During the summers of 1902 and 1903, Nevin had actually lived among the Blackfeet Indians and documented much of their folklore and transcribed their music. I'd like to share with you, if you'd allow me, a couple of reviews from those musicales, and I love these. Um, we have several today, and I love the colorful, somewhat Victorian language that was used in these descriptions. This one from April 28, 1907. At Mrs. Roosevelt's musicale on Tuesday evening, Mr. Arthur Nevin and Mr. Walter McClintock of Pittsburgh were the chief factors. Mr. McClintock, who has spent much time with the Blackfoot Indians, presented a series of wonderful colored photographs of intimate scenes in the daily life of the tribe of the Indians, with which he made his home and whose legendary lore he studied and collected. In connection with his researches, Mr. McClintock, who was adopted into the tribe, devoted much time to the consideration of the tribal songs and chants used in the several devotional and festal ceremonies. With these for a foundation, Mr. Nevin built his Indian Grand Opera Poya, which with the aid of Mr. McClintock's pictures he interpreted by text and musical excerpt. The freshness and originality of the theme and its handling engendered the liveliest enthusiasm among Mrs. Roosevelt's guests while the scenes and incidents depicted by Mr. Clintock appealed with great force to the president owing to his familiarity with frontier life. And another, the president and Mrs. Roosevelt have given two most interesting evening musicales at the opening of their spring round of festivities. At the first, Mr. Arthur Nevin, the composer and younger brother of the brilliant Ethelbert Nevin, who as an aside I had never heard of before, who had died at the height of his youth and fame, played upon the piano selections from his Indian opera, Poya. Poya is the story of a young man of humble origin in love with the daughter of a chief, but scorned because of his humble and mysterious birth and because of a disfiguring scar on his face. Mr. Walter McClintock assisted Mr. Nevin with an illuminating talk on Indian folk songs and legends. This is the character page from the opera telling the different characters, and there is Mr. Nevin. Um, on a similar occasion, just in keeping with the promotion of Indian music, another scholar performer, Natalie Curtis, surprised White House guests by announcing at lunch that she would sing an Indian song as Grace, and Roosevelt praised the depth and dignity of the Indian thought represented in her collection of music. I want to tell you a little bit more about this opera, Poya. I am fascinated that of all music that this was one chosen to be presented at the Roosevelt White House. The opera itself has only ever received two full-scale productions. One, its premiere in 1907 in Berlin, which was actually postponed for a short time so that President Roosevelt could attend it. And then the second performance was not done until 2005, when it was a, uh, presented in a full-scale production in Great Falls, Montana, um, the conductor Gordon Johnson shared with me much information about this. And in a moment, when I share with you some of the music, we'll have some slides that some of them are, are from that production. At the Berlin performance, the, the music and production were met with a hostile um, reaction. They did not like this opera. And so it has not had a very good life. And, um, but I hope that we can give it a new life. I think that it has some really interesting music and interesting um, roles for the, for the opera cast. Uh, just a little more about Ar Arthur Nevin. He was a composer, conductor, and ethnomusicologist, and he studied among, with, among other people, Engelbert Humperdinck, who wrote Hansel and Gretel, and I'll speak about that in a few moments. 
Um, he had returned to the United States after studying in Europe and conducted concerts of his own works and composed and conducted at the McDowell Colony. Edward McDowell is another person I'll mention in a few moments. Um, he joined the music department of the University of Kansas Lawrence in 1915 and during the war, war, war he directed choirs and bands and in, Mem in 1920 he was appointed the municipal director in Memphis where he conducted the choirs and orchestras there. So now I welcome you to my musicale and I'm going to transfer to the piano and play the ballet music from Poya. This music is instrumental music. Obviously this is written to be performed by an orchestra, but I could not fit them in my bag. And so I'm just going to play the piano transcription while we look at some of the images that they might have seen that night at the musicale at the White House.
So I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I love that music. I don't, I don't know about you, but I think it's just uh, delightful. And um, I wish that I had been there for that, that wonderful uh, music howl that evening. I'm just going to go back to my PowerPoint here. Um, Now I'm going to do a little taste test with you. I'll actually venture back to the piano, and I'll play two numbers. Um, and I want to see which one you favor. And then there's a point to my a point to my madness. Excerpt one. So, one of those was Theodore Roosevelt's favorite, and one of those was one of Edith's favorite. Um, I bet you can't guess which is which. Is which. Um, Roosevelt's taste was thought of as being, in some cases, warlike in loving the Cheyenne victory songs, the outlaw ballad of Jesse James, and the military Danny Deaver, which Edith specifically had asked at one point not to be performed, and his favorite, the Irish fight song that Custer loved, Gary Owen. Um, the second piece was To a Wild Rose by Edward McDowell. And while there's no exact documentation of McDowell's having performed in person in the White House, the White House historian Elise Kirk says that more McDowell was heard during the White House than at any other time. McDowell was a contemporary of Roosevelt's, also born in New York City. He was born in 1860 and died in 1908. Um, an artist colony is named for him. And it, also in 1904, he was also um, honored with membership into the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He's most known for his second piano concerto and his piece, Woodland Sketches, from which To a Wild Rose comes. Um, another striking example of 
Theodore Roosevelt's musical leanings towards the kind of militant music and, and excitement in music, um, and I can relate to this, I'll share with you momentarily, happened in 1914. German conductor Dr. Karl Muck was the music director and conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra from 1906 to 1908 and again 1912 to 1918. And when war broke out in 1914, he was the target of suspicion. The Boston Symphony management had been asked for a concert in Providence, Rhode Island to play the national anthem. And this memo did not get to Dr. Muck and so they did not play it. And Theodore Roosevelt specifically criticized Dr. Muck for not performing the national anthem. And eventually, I don't know if it was because of this, I think it was because of the suspicion against him, but eventually Dr. Muck was jailed. Um, I had a similar situation this past Sunday with the Bemidji Symphony, and thankfully I was not incarcerated. In um, 1909, Margaret Downing wrote the following article about Edith Roosevelt. A music-loving woman, Mrs. Roosevelt has given an impetus to high-class music by her constant presence at the symphony concerts, the best operas and orchestral events, and by her generous entertainment of artists and musicians at the White House. For seven years, her music house have set the fashion for such entertainments in Washington, and she has given pleasure to hundreds of guests. This winter, she dispensed with the music house for dancing parties in compliment to her young daughter, Miss Ethel, who has just made her debut. I think we've already heard mention that Edith Roosevelt was the model of a modern first lady, and she infused the White House with music and literature at a very high level, creating a thriving art scene during the Theodore Roosevelt presidency. Music was known as being her particular passion. There's no real documentation at this point that she um, actually played an instrument, probably a little bit of piano. She had a particular fondness for the music of Richard Wagner, and one of her most publicized philanthropic events was a benefit performance at the Metropolitan Opera of Humperdinck's Hansel and Gretel to benefit the New York Legal Aid Society. Humperdinck and his wife came all the way from Germany for this event and were invited to the White House in December of 1905, where Humperdinck presented the president with a bound copy of the score. Humperdinck was very impressed that President Roosevelt was familiar with his work and that he made the literary connection with the opera. Edith Roosevelt is given credit for a number of firsts in the White House, although there were certainly musical performances in the, in, with presidents since George Washington. She is credited for hosting the first musicale, for presenting the first full concerts by noted pianists, for presenting the first um, opera, and for presenting the first clavichord recital. She began these important and grand scale performances, giving about eight a year, um, with approximately 350 people attending the East Room. These usually took place late in the afternoon or late in the evening. In 1903, Edith acquired a grand piano for the White House, a gift from the Steinway Company. I believe I have a photo of this. Um, the gold leaf piano has the coat of arms portraying the original 13 states. And you can't see it on this slide, but inside the lid is a painting by Thomas Wilmer Dewing portraying the nine muses paying court to a woman representing the American Republic. The instrument was used in the White House until 1938, and it's now at the Smithsonian. The Steinway Company played an important role in the Roosevelt musicales. The company had previously created a process through which they would encourage specific pianists to perform there. They started this um, with President McKinley, and the man who was the sort of entrepreneur of this was a man named Joseph Burr Tiffany, who ran the art department at Steinway and had provided these performers for President McKinley. It's interesting, when Edith planned these musicales, she didn't just schedule them or just put, you know, say that she wanted to have one, but she often specifically dictated what kind of music she wanted and specific pieces that she wanted played. In the case of the famous pianist Ferruccio Buzzoni, who performed January 28th, 1904, 
she wanted him to make up a program that will interest a very miscellaneous audience. And she specifically asked him to play something from Wagner's Parsifal. Buzzoni elected not to play the music of Wagner, which is not really common solo piano music anyway, and instead played a program of Beethoven, Chopin, and Liszt. Um, I am intrigued by Edith Roosevelt's um, love of Wagner and also the way that she had the Marine Band play pieces of Wagner. Um, this was evident also at Alice's wedding. There was quite a lot of music played at that wedding, I think about nine selections overall, and they began with um, the march from Tannhauser. And I also wanted to mention to you a document that I found when looking for um, materials for this presentation, and it's right on the, the TR Center's website, and I didn't know this existed before, and it's a sweet little notebook that Quentin Roosevelt created. It's from March 16th of 1905, and it was a little scrapbook called Music and Musician's Notebook, telling the story of some classical composers. And on page one, he writes, in, in his little cursive round handwriting, music is God's best gift to man. And he writes essays on Handel, Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, and pastes some articles in there as well. And then he was obviously had as a goal to write about Karl Maria, Maria von Weber, Mendelssohn, Robert Schumann, which he does include a, a pasted in picture of Schumann's grave, um, Schubert, Chopin, and Wagner. And I mention this because in that notebook, the picture of Wagner, and he doesn't write the essay yet, but the picture of Wagner is incredibly ornate with flowers and things around it, much more ornate than the other, um, the other composers. But on a side note, um, Wagner was a well documented as being um, quite an anti-Semite and his music was later championed by Hitler and the Nazi regime and it would no doubt be highly controversial in this day and age for anyone in the public eye to truly come out championing the music of Wagner. Edith had her own sense of controversy specifically when it came to female composers and to the use of the Negro spiritual. There's Mr. Buzzoni. By 1903, pianist Fanny Bloomfield Zeisler had attained a reputation as one of the nation's leading pianists. But despite this, Edith didn't think that an audience would enjoy a whole evening of a woman pianist. While she later had whole evenings of male pianists, she didn't think the audience would like this, and she wanted Zeisler to invite a singer to join her. And so Joseph Bert Tiffany wrote to Zeisler telling her this, he said, these musicals are purely social affairs and a rigid adherence to the musical part is not necessarily observed, he stated. Zeisler indicated that she did not want to perform with anyone else and she declined the invitation and did not play in the White House again until 1910 when she and violinist Fritz Chrysler played for one of Mrs. Taft's musicals. Another connection that I found interesting in the Roosevelt White House with regard to music is that the first official musicale of his presidency reflected another common thread of performers, those who reflected the president's Dutch heritage. The first performer of the musicale was Dutch pianist Edward Zelderwist, who performed under the sponsorship of the Dutch minister to the US, and later a Miss Corey Scheffer, a young Dutch violinist. And again, if you'd permit me to read a couple of these reviews, I think they're just delightful. This one from April 28th, also 1907. Following the dinner on Wednesday evening came a delightful program presented by Miss Corey Sheffer, a young Dutch violinist whose ability to express the music of her country folk contributed to a notably enjoyable occasion. Miss Sheffer, who is a pupil of Isai, displays the simplicity and poise of her master, characteristics which showed to great advantage in the selection she rendered while an element of the picturesque was introduced by her appearance in the quaint peasant costume of the Netherlands. Also on that program, um, the foreign minister to the Netherlands, uh, von Swinderen, explained the songs to the people there. 
that she was playing. Edith Roosevelt favored singers and pianists, and over the year, years, there were a number of them. During the first year, tenor George Devoy, baritone Edwin Isham, Lila Livingston Morse, and Heinrich Meyer, and also Cornelia Diaz, the Roosevelt children's piano teacher, her sister Louise, and her sister Diaz Standish. The highlight of the 1902 was the famous Polish pianist, composer, and statesman Ignaz Paderewski, who played a program of Beethoven, Chopin, and his own works. Oops, not sure where Paderewski went. Um, Paderewski became one of the most international, uh, famous international pianists of all time, began composing at age six, and in 1910, he spoke at the unveiling of a monument in Krakow, which thereafter symbolized Polish aspirations. He worked ceaselessly for the Polish cause, and then when Poland became an independent nation in 1919, he became the prime minister and foreign minister of the government. In 1922, he resumed his recitals, raising large amounts of money for war victims and sponsoring several competitions and scholarships. In 1936, he was featured in a film called Moonlight Sonata, and he died in 1925 when Poland was again enslaved. Paderewski remembered Theodore Roosevelt as he played, saying, Roosevelt always listened with charming interest and applauded vociferously and always shouted out, bravo, bravo, fine, splendid, even during the performance. One wonders if Theodore Roosevelt might have whooped if he knew the technique. The concluding musical performances of the 1902 social season spoke to the racial mores of the day. Six artists were featured, Edith and May Pelliser, Wilford Russell, Miss Leach, and the Mrs. Turner. The Turners specialized in Negro songs that evoked, quote, the vanished days of their old South and accompanied themselves on the lute and banjo. And Mary Leach had made a career of rendering black dialect tunes. Some of the documentation regarding Edith Roosevelt's rhetoric with regard to these specific performances and her obvious championing of some of the selections performed is confusing in its references to a certain kind of bigotry while at the same time it's documented that she definitely agreed that the Negro spiritual had a lasting value and she made a point to feature it on these musical programs. It's also noted that when black composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor conducted an African American choral group singing his composition Hiawatha before an integrated audience that Edith made a point of being there. On January 8th, 1904, Edith featured popular baritone David Bisfam in a program of American songs. And on January 15th, cellist Pablo Casals joined bass Myron Whitney and pianist Ward Stevenson. Casals played a program of The Swan by Camille Sansaw, Spanish Dance by Popper, and other chamber music. Casals would next play in the White House on November 13th, 1961, for the President and Mrs. Kennedy. And I wanted to share with you today, I, I have told people and, and agree with Clay that that is one of the most fascinating aspects I know of about White House musical performances, is that this great cellist played for both presidents, Theodore Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy. Casals lived to be 96, and during his last year, he was given an award at the Kennedy Center and he made the following speech, and I'd like to share that with you because he refers back to that first performance in the White House. I am a very, very old man, and I have lived and have been in this city very much before you all. I remember that first concert that I gave here at the beginning of the century. It was very touching for me. I was a young man at that time, and I was very astonished to have received so much of your applause. After that, I've been many times in this city, so let me say that you are my friends. I am your friend. When I was young, or relatively young, I didn't have much time to dedicate to that necessary miracle of music, Bach, for the public or myself. But now I feel younger than ever because I play Bach every day. And keep in mind, this is coming from a 96-year-old. I play Bach every day. Every day I look to the Lord of Nature, and then I play two preludes and two fugues of Bach on the piano. Then I go to my old cello, and I, many times I thank God for what he has given me so many years of my life. 
And so despite my age, I am still a musician, a musician 100 times. On January 22nd, Henry Huss, a pianist and composer, appeared with Hildegard Hoffman, a pianist, and Glenn Hall, tenor. January 29th, the previously mentioned performance of Ferruccio Bizzoni. In the end of the 1904 social season, Edith Roosevelt held 15 musicales, and through 1908, she would host another 16. Intermittent with this were additional performances of the Vienna Boys Choir, a Welsh Boys Choir to whom Theodore Roosevelt had apparently served sherry to the consternation of his critics, and also Dr. Thaddeus Rich, concertmaster and assistant conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra, who performed not only for Theodore Roosevelt, but also for Taft and for Calvin Coolidge, also pianist Joseph Hoffman. January 29, 1906, featured Philadelphia Orchestra cellist Joseph Holman and again bass Myron Whitney. And February 12th, the Boston Symphony Quartet, led by violinist Willie Hess. In January 1907, baritone Francis Rogers and violinist Edith Jewell, and in February, an impromptu recital at the White House by Russian pianist Joseph Levine, whom Edith had heard the night before solo with the Philadelphia Orchestra. The final musicale of the TR presidency took place on February 19, 1909, and featured the Buffalo Vocal Quartet. It is said that they performed sad songs and that the occasion was, quote, one of general breakdown on the part of many. Ironically, the Buffalo Quartet had been the group to perform at President McKinley's funeral where they sang Newman's Lead Kindly Light. And I'd like to close with this thought. Admittedly, Theodore Roosevelt is not the first president who comes to mind when I think of presidents who outwardly supported music and the arts. Um, John F. Kennedy certainly, Thomas Jefferson certainly. But in my research for this, I found a quote that has now become one of my favorites of all time, and it came from Theodore Roosevelt. The Third Street Music School settlement in New York is the oldest community music school in our country. It was established in 1894, and to this day still offers lessons to adults and children of many different musical styles and opportunities. This is from an article March 5, 1919, but it refers to eight years earlier. The passionate love of Theodore Roosevelt for children and his equally passionate desire that American children should share alike in all things which go to make up the perfect citizen were very clearly shown about eight years ago when he visited the Third Street Music School settlement in New York City. He had listened to the orchestra of East Side Boys and Girls from many foreign lands play a movement from a Haydn symphony to a trio of tiny pupils who astonished him with the Vidor Serenade for piano, violin, and cello, followed by various piano and violin solos. After joining the pupils, orchestra, and audience in singing America, he said at the end of a wonderful speech, Boys and girls, do not envy your neighbors who may have many automobiles in their garages while you have your piano, your violin, or your cello. Prepare yourself to earn the living wage but do not forget to leave the casement open to let in the light that never was on sea or land. Let the love for literature, painting, sculpture, architecture, and above all, music enter your lives. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions for Dr. Beverly Everett about Theodore Roosevelt, the White House, and music. You know, when I hear Poya, I'm just going to take your word for it that it's outstanding, but it didn't feel very Blackfeet. It, until the very end there, where there was a little Native American rhythmic, it, was, it didn't feel like it had been inspired by Blackfeet culture. What do you say? Oh, you have it. Oh, well, that was only part of the music, and, and certainly the music of it was probably equally influenced by the music of the time, the great sense of, of romanticism carrying over from the 19th century. You can hear that in the harmonies. There's little elements of chromaticism in there. And, and the style of it, you hear those different little waltzes and things reflected a lot of the musical style at the time. Um, Dr. Everett, 
you laid out this long uh, list of performers and 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 music that came to the White House during the Roosevelt seven years and 171 days. Do you have any sense of how that how much more that was than what happened during the McKinley era or the Tafts who came afterwards? I mean, how were the Roosevelts more emphatic about this? It sounds like some of the musicals continued when the Tafts came to power. Um, the Roosevelt presidency was definitely a turning point. Um, I don't have the exact numbers of the people who came before him, but it's noted by, the, by especially by White House historian Elise Kirk, who's written a book about this, that, that if you look at this as one large timeline, the Theodore Roosevelt presidency is the pivotal turning point of the times in terms of music in the White House that would not be, no one else would come near that until the Kennedys. Questions? Yes, here. Al? Right, what does he mean when he says Native American themes? Does he mean American themes or American Indian themes? He specifically meant American Indian themes and had spent um, time during his time in Iowa collecting these and hearing them and incorporating them into the, specifically into the New World Symphony, but in some of his other music, you can hear little, little hints of that, hints of those melodies as well. And so, I mean, that's really remarkable in itself that Dvorak had this what, what led him to this? I think it was his own, the way that he had used the, the, the traits from the Czech folk tunes. Um, if you listen to his symphonies, there are Czech dance tunes, rhythms, those vivid melodies. And he wanted to find where are those melody, ma melodies in American culture and bring those out. Um, and that's where he found them, was in the Negro spiritual and in the, the American Indian melodies. I think there was another question over here somewhere. Yes. Theodore Roosevelt and Ragtime. Well, it's noted that, and I didn't really get into this, but that it, one of the things that was credited with the Roosevelt White House is being the first time jazz was played in the White House, specifically because Alice Roosevelt requested the, the Marine Band play Scott Joplin's Maple Leaf Rag. Um, someone, and I, I think it was Hal, I can't remember, were talk, and I were talking at lunch, I believe, about the use of jazz I didn't find any specific jazz performers of the time that were invited to the White House, um, but, but all of this music, they would ask to be played by the Marine Band, and the Marine Band would arrange it and play um, pretty much whatever they requested. But it was Alice pushing this. It was Alice. Probably just yeah. to mess with their father, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, the Great Falls production of Poya, the second ever production of this piece. Well, there was a great New York Times article about this, and apparently a rancher had somehow come by the score and shared it with the conductor and, um, and wanted to see this done. There was a committee, and the conductor shared with me, which this is a dream come true for any conductor. The committee said, the budget is endless, so do what you need to do and they put on a full-scale production. There was an artist, I believe, that used um, the, the set photos from the Berlin production and created those. Um, there was dance, and so you, you can see a little bit of this. It does exist on YouTube. But um, I, I don't know how much you know about this. I don't know anything about it, but I'm, I wonder how the Blackfoot tribe felt about this because it would be possible for modern Blackfeet Indians to regard this as cultural appropriation or misapplication of, of 19th century sensibilities. Do you have any sense of how the Blackfeet were involved in the project? Um, I don't have a sense of that, but in the research I did for this, I was curious as to, okay, this happened at around the beginning of the century where there was this push to include the Negro spiritual to promote Indian music. How did that manifest then through the years? 
there aren't very many Amer uh, American Indian operas. And one that I know of quite recently, the Minneapolis composer Linda Tudis Haugen wrote a, an opera on the story of Pocahontas. And that was not well received. It was done in um, Duluth with much scandal surrounding it. So, so these, are, um, these are sensitive topics and sensitive for music, direct music directors when, when we want to try to program something. Po Pocahontas is a long way from Duluth. Um, uh, any other questions for Dr. Everett? Am I missing anyone? Yes, go ahead. There could be that resemblance, and again, I think, and we'll get into this if we had time today to play the excerpts from all of the sheet music, there are many common threads that had to do with the tonal language and the musical style of the day that come through these different people, and certainly from, from teacher to student, that gets passed down as well in those influences. So here's what we're going to do. First of all, thank you, Dr. Beverly Everett. Thank you. And there's, there's no break at this point, but we want to segue into this next portion where Dr. Everett plays a role.